Hello there. Today I have a special treat for you. It is a 13th century manuscript um, called Ora Linda. And I hope that you're enjoying my content. If you are, please snuggle up next to the like button. I always appreciate that. And let's get started. The Oralinda Book from a manuscript of the 13th century. Okay, my son, you must preserve these books with body and soul. They contain the history of all our people as well as our forefathers. Last year I saved them in the flood as well as you and your mother, but they got wet and therefore began to perish. In order not to lose them, I copied them on foreign paper. In case you inherit them, you must copy them likewise, and your children must do so too, so that they may never be lost. Written at Lewart in 3,449th year after Atland was submerged, that is, according to the Christian reckoning, the year 1256, Hiddo, surnamed Ora de Linda. Beloved successors, for the sake of our dear forefathers and our dear liberty, I entreat you a thousand times, never let the eye of a monk look on these writings. They are very insinuating, but they destroy in an underhand manner all that relates to us Frisians. In order to gain rich benefices, they conspire with foreign kings who know that we are their greatest enemies because we dare to speak to their people of liberty, rights, and the duties of princes. Therefore, they seek to destroy all that we derive from our forefathers and all that is left of our old customs. Ah, my beloved ones, I have visited their courts. If Waralda permits it, we do not shew ourselves strong to resist. They will altogether exterminate us. Lico, surnamed Urva de Linda. Written at Ludwart, Anno Domini 803. The Book of Adela's Followers. Thirty years after the day on which the Volksmutter was murdered by the commander Magi was a time of great distress. All the states that lie on the other side of the Wesser had been wrestled from us and had fallen under the power of Magi, and it looked as if his power was to become supreme over the whole land. To avert this misfortune, a general assembly of the people was summoned which was attended by all men who stood in good repute with Mogden priestesses. Then at the end of three days, the whole council was in confusion and in the same position as when they came together. Thereupon, Adela demanded to be heard and said, You all know that I was three years Burgmagd. You know also that I was chosen for Volksmutter and that I refused to be Volksmutter because I wished to marry a Pole. But what you do not know is that I have watched everything that has happened as if I had really been your Volksmutter. I have constantly traveled about observing what was going on. By that means I have become acquainted with many things that others do not know. You said yesterday that our relatives on the other side of the Wesser were dull and cowardly, but I may tell you that the Magi has not won a single village from them by force of arms, but only by detestable deceit, and still more by the rapacity of their dukes and nobles. Freya has said we must not admit amongst us any but free people, but what have they done? They have imitated our enemies, and instead of killing their prisoners, 
or letting them go free, they have despised the counsel of Freya and have made slaves of them. Because they have acted thus, Freya no, cared no longer to watch over them. They robbed others of their freedom and therefore lost their own. This is well known to you, but I will tell you how they came to sink so low. The Fen women had children. These grew up with our free children. They played and gambled together in the fields and were also together by the hearth. There they learned with pleasure the loose ways of the Fens, because they were bad and new, and thus they became denationalized in spite of the efforts of their parents. When the children grew up and saw that the children of the Fens handled no weapons and scarcely worked, they took a distaste for work and became proud. The principal men and their cleverest sons made up to the wanton daughters of the Fens and their own daughters, led astray by this bad example, allowed themselves to be beguiled by the handsome young Fens in derision of their depraved fathers. When the Magi found this out, he took the handsomest of his Fens and Magyars and promised them red crows with golden horns to let themselves be taken prisoner by our people in order to spread his doctrines. His people did even more. Children disappeared and were taken away to the uplands and after they had been brought up in his pernicious doctrines were sent back. When these pretended prisoners had learned our language, they persuaded the dukes and nobles that they should become subject to the, to the Magi, that then their sons would succeed to them without having to be elected. Those who by their go good deeds had gained a piece of land in front of their house, they promised on their side should receive in addition a piece behind. Those who had got a piece before and behind should have a rondeal complete circuit. And those who had a rondeal should have a whole freehold. If the seniors were true to Freya, then they changed their course and turned to the degenerate sons. Yesterday, there were among you those who would have called the whole people together to compel the eastern states to return to their duty. According to my humble opinion, they would have made a great mistake. Suppose that there was a very serious epidemic among the cattle. Would you run the risk of sending your own healthy cattle among the sick ones? Certainly not. Everyone must see what doing that would turn out, that doing that would turn out very badly for the whole of the cattle. Who then would be so imprudent as to send their children among a people wholly depraved? If I were to give you any advice, it would be to choose a new Wolfsmulder. I know that you are in a difficulty about it, because out of the 13 Burgmagden, that we still have remaining eight are candidates for the dignity, but I should pay no attention to that. Chuantia, the Burgmagd of Medizelblek, who is not a candidate, is a person of knowledge and sound sense, and quite as attached to our people and our customs as all the rest together. I should farther recommend that you should visit all the citadels and write down all the laws of Freya's texts, as well as all the histories and all that is written on the walls in order that it may not be destroyed with the citadels. It stands written that every Volksmulder and every Bergmagd shall have assistants and messengers, 21 maidens and seven apprentices, if I might add more, I would recommend that all the respectable girls in the towns should be taught. For I say positively, and time will show it, that if you wish to remain true children of Freya, never to be vanquished by fraud or arms, you must take care to bring up your daughters 
as true Freya's daughters. We must teach the children how great our country has been, what great men our forefathers were, how great we still are if we compare ourselves to others. We must tell them of the sea heroes, of their mighty deeds and distant voyages. All these stories must be told by the fireside and in the field, wherever it may be, in times of joy or sorrow. If you wish to impress it on the brains and the hearts of your sons, you must let it flow through your rip, the lips of your wives and your daughters. Adela's advice was followed. These are the Gravetmen under whose direction this book is composed. Apol, Adela's husband, three times a sea king, Gravetmen of Ostfleiland and Linda Orden, the towns Nugarda, Lindhim, and Stavia are under his care. The Saxman Storo, Sitia's husband, Gravetman over the Hugfennen and Wooden. Nine times he was chosen as Duke or Hermann, commander. The towns Buda and Managarda, Forda, are under his care. Abiello, Gialtia's husband, Gravetman over Suderflyland. He was three times Hermann, and towns Aiken, Lüderberg, and Katzberg are under his care. Enoch, Dewick's husband, Gravetman over Westflyland and Texel. He was chosen nine times for sea king. Waterberg, Medisblick, Forana, and Freiesberg are under his care. Fop den Fop den Roe's husband, Gravetman over the seven islands. He was five times sea king. The town of Walhalagara is under his care. This was inscribed upon the walls of Freiesberg in Texland, as well as at Stavia and Medisblick. It was Freya's day and seven times seven years had elapsed since Festa was appointed Volksmolder by the desire of Freya. The citadel of Medisblick was ready and a burgmod ma was chosen. Vesta was about to light her new lamp, and when she had done so in the presence of all the people, Freya called from her watch star so that everyone could hear it. Vesta, take your style and write the things that I may not speak. Vesta did as she was bid, and thus we became Freya's children and our earliest history began. This is our earliest history. Waralda, who alone is eternal and good, made the beginning, then commenced time. Time wrought all things, even the earth. The earth bore grass, herbs, and trees, all useful and all noxious animals. All that is good, and useful she brought forth by day, and all that is bad and inju injurious by night. After the twelfth jewel feast, she brought forth three maidens, Lyda out of fierce heat, Finda out of strong heat, Freya out of moderate heat. When the last came into existence, Waralda breathed his spirit upon her in order that men might be bound to him. As soon as they were full grown, they took pleasure and delight in the visions of Ralda. Hatred found its way among them. They each bore twelve sons and twelve daughters. At every jewel time a couple. Thence come all mankind. Lida was black, with hair curled like a lamb's. Her eyes shone like stars and shot out glances like those of a bird of prey. Lida was acute. She could hear a snake glide and could smell a fish in the water. Lida was strong and nimble. She could bend a large tree 
Yet when she walked, she did not bruise a flower stalk. Lida was violent. Her voice was loud. And when she screamed in anger, every creature quailed. Wonderful Lida. She had no regard for laws. Her actions were governed by her passions. To help the weak, she would kill the strong. And when she had done it, she would weep by their bodies. Poor Lida. She turned gray by her mad behavior, and at last she died heartbroken by the wickedness of her children, foolish children. They accused each other of their mother's death. They howled and fought like wolves. And while they did this, the birds devoured the corpse. Who can refrain from tears at such a recital? Finda was yellow, and her hair was like the mane of a horse. She could not bend a tree, but where Lida killed one lion, she killed ten. Finda was seductive. Her voice was sweeter than any bird's. Her eyes were alluring and enticing, but whoever looked upon them became her slave. Finda was unreasonable. She wrote thousands of laws, but she never obeyed one. She despised the frankness of the good and gave herself up to flatterers. That was her misfortune. Her head was too full, but her heart was too vain. She loved nobody but herself, and she wished that all should love her. False Finda, honey sweet with her words, but those who trusted them found sorrow at hand. Selfish Finda, she wished to rule everybody, and her sons were like her. They made their sisters serve them, and they slew each other for the mastery. Treacherous Finda, one wrong word would irritate her, and the cruelest deeds did not affect her. If she saw a lizard swallow a spider, she shuddered, but if she saw her children kill a Frisian, her bosom swelled with pleasure. Unfortunate Finda, she died in the bloom of her age, and the mode of her death is unknown hypocritical children. Her corpse was buried under a costly stone, pompous inscriptions were written on it, and loud lamentations were heard at it. But in private, not a tear was shed. Despicable people, the laws that Finda established were written on golden tablets, but the object for which they were made was never attained. The good laws were abolished, and selfish instituted bad ones in their place. O oh, Fenda, the earth overflowed with blood, and your children were mown down like grass. Yes, Fenda, those were the fruits of your vanity. Look down from your watchstar and weep. Freya was white, like the snow at sunrise, and the blue of her eyes vied with the rainbow. Beautiful Freya, like the rays of the sun shone the locks of her hair, which were as fine as spider webs. Clever Freya, when she opened her lips, the birds ceased to sing and the leaves to quiver. Powerful Freya, at the glance of her eye, the lion lay down at her feet and the adder withheld his poison. Pure Freya, her food was honey and her beverage was dew gathered from the cups of flowers. Sensible Freya, the first lesson that she taught her children was self-control, and the second was the love of virtue. And when they were grown, she taught them to value liberty. For she said, without liberty, all other virtues serve to make you slaves, and to disgrace your origin. Generous Freya, she never allowed metal to be dug from the earth for her own benefit, but when she did it, it was for the general use. Most happy Freya, like the starry host in the firmament, her children clustered around her. Wise Freya, when she had seen her children reach the seventh generation, she summoned them all to Flyland, and there gave them her text, saying, Let this be your guide, and it can never go ill with you. Exalted Freya, when she had thus spoken, the earth shook like the sea of Ralda. 
The ground of Flyland sunk beneath her feet. The air was dimmed by tears. And when they looked for their mother, she was already risen to her watching star. Then at length, thunder burst from the clouds, and the lightning wrote upon the firmament, Watch. Far-seeing Freya. The land from which she had risen was now a stream, and except her text, all that was in it was overwhelmed. Obedient children, when they came to themselves again, they made this high mound and built this citadel upon it. And on the walls they wrote the text, and that everyone should be able to find it, they called the land about it, Textland. Therefore it shall remain, as long as the earth shall be the earth. Freya's text, prosperity awaits the free. At last they shall see me again, through him only, I can recognize as free who is neither a slave to another nor to himself. This is my counsel. When in dire distress, and when mental and physical energy avail nothing, then have recourse to the spirit of Rowalda. But do not appeal to him before you have tried all other means, for I tell you beforehand, and time will prove its truth, that those who give way to discouragement sink under their burdens. To Ruralda's spirit only shall you bend the knee in gratitude, thrice fold, for what you have received, for what you do receive, and for the hope of aid in time of need. You have seen how speedily I come to your assistance. Do likewise to your neighbor, but wait not for his entreaties. The suffering would curse you. My maidens would ease your name from the book, and I would regard you as a stranger. Let not your neighbor express his thanks to you on bended knee, which is only due to Geralda's spirit. Envy would assail you. Wisdom would ridicule you, and my maidens would accuse you of irreverence. Four things are given for your enjoyment. Air, water, land, and fire. But Waralda is the sole possessor of them. Therefore my counsel to you is, choose upright men who will fairly divide the labor and the fruits so that no man shall be exempt from work or from duty of defense. If ever it should happen that one of your people should sell his freedom, he is not of you, he is a bastard. I counsel you to expel him and his mother from the land. Repeat this to your children morning, noon, and night, till they think of it in their dreams. If any man, man shall deprive another, even his debtor, of his liberty, let him be to you as a vile slave, and I advise you to burn his body and that of his mother in an open place, and bury them fifty feet below the ground, so that no grass shall grow upon them. It would poison your cattle. Meddle not with the people of Lida, nor of Fenda, because Waralda would help them. And any injury that you inflicted on them would recoil upon your own heads. If it should happen that they cross, that they come to you for advice or assistance, then it behooves you to help them. But if they should rob you, then fall upon them with fire and sword. If any of them should seek a daughter of yours to wife, and she is willing, Explain to her her folly, but if she will follow her lover, let her go in peace. If your son wishes for a daughter of theirs, do the same as to your daughter. But let not either one or the other ever return among you, for they would introduce foreign morals and customs, and if these were accepted by you, I could no longer watch over you. 
Upon my servant, Fasta, I have placed all my hopes. Therefore you must choose her for Eremodor. Follow my advice, then she will hereafter remain my servant as well as all the sacred maidens who succeed her. Then shall the lamp, which I have lighted for you, never be extinguished. Its brightness shall always illuminate your intellect, and you shall always remain as free from foreign domination as your fresh river water is distinct from the salt sea. I will stop here for now, um, but this will be a uh, this will be continued until I've completed the entire manuscript reading. If you're enjoying it, please click like, um, hug the like button for me, make a comment um, if you have any questions, and uh, hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.